All right, welcome to uh, the final chapter of our packages, cohort six. Um, today we're going to talk about chapter 22, releasing to CRAN. Um, and if all goes well, I am going to click the button and submit something to CRAN at the end of all this. So, uh, yeah, this was, <laughs> it was really good. Like this package is something I have had that a bunch of my stuff I'm currently working on imports this package. And I haven't like, I've been trying to get it perfect. And then finally realized today, you know what, just submit it. It's, it's good enough. You can always update it. So. Um, we'll see, maybe it won't get accepted, but all right. So, uh, we want to be able to prepare a new package for release to CRAN. So that's something that's never been on CRAN, uh, prepare to update a package on CRAN and then release that new package to CRAN or update that package on CRAN, uh, deal with CRAN failures and wrap up a CRAN release. So, um, we probably won't see these two <laughs> in live action today, but we'll see, uh, prepare a new package and um, release a new package. All right. And actually, I already did most of the prepare, but we'll see. All right. Um, so she talks about this function, use this use release issue. And it's interesting because it definitely changes over time. So I don't think it 100% matches the book right now. And it like it checks whether that the package you're trying to release is already on CRAN or if it isn't and like asks you for version number that you want to use and all things like that. And so the exact output of this depends uh, the state that a package is in. And I didn't have one handy um, that wasn't brand new. So I don't know every step that it will show um, when it's not brand new. And again, those steps can change over time. But so we're going to kind of do a best guess <laughs> at what they do. Um, so yeah, you, you use this issue or this function. I don't um, I don't have it handy, but it'll just, it uh, shows you, actually, I guess in the book she shows, um, it just, it asks you, uh, are you doing a major, a minor, or a patch release? You tell it what you want to do, and it will, it like sets up kind of the intention of what the version number is going to be. So if you're at 0, 0, 0, 9000 like I was, and I said I want a minor release, it just made it go 0, 010. Zero. Um, and so if we look at this thing over here, like the description, oh, actually, <laughs> I'm later in this process. The description did not say 0, 010 zero yet, but then it does when we do a later step. Um, so, but yeah, that just kind of like prepares it. It lets it know, okay, you're going to work on doing this release and it creates the issue, which I don't have in that window that is handy. Let me do that. So it created this issue with uh, release stable 010 um, and created all these checkboxes, which I've been going through to make sure everything is done. It is super handy. There are things that like, it is definitely one of those functions that's built for the tidyverse team. Like not everyone is going to actually write a blog post. Um, not every step is necessarily going to approve to you. And we're gonna see that it isn't actually updated with the very, very latest. Um, our hub has a new way of doing these uh, checks now, um, but it should be soon. <laughs> Um, next, she says to polish the news. So uh, again, this is going to look a little different. This this said development version, and then it automatically changed to 010 when I did a later step. By default, when you create the news, it just says initial CRAN submission. And honestly, that's fine for the first version because the news is the package. Like there's no <laughs> changes to point out, but we had a whole chapter or a part of a chapter before talking about that. So, you know, she says to kind of make sure that anything you've been putting in the news makes sense. Uh, there's this function use CRAN comments that will create this CRAN comments.md. And by default for your first version, it's going to look exactly like this. 
uh, to the point that I just copy this file when I set up packages because um, this is what it's going to be all the time. Uh, in the note, you know, it'll say it has one note and that note is that it's a new release. And that's just is a thing that lets their systems know, oh, okay, this is a, a new package. If you're doing a normal or not a normal, but like a second um, push to CRAN, uh, if you have any notes, we're gonna talk about this a little bit, but if you have any, you need to explain them here. Um, this is kind of your best way to communicate with uh, the people, the editors on CRAN. Um, she says to update installation instructions in README. And actually I wanted to show this because there's a fancy way to do this that I learned about that you can put the triple colon and dot package down release and dot package down devel around the two forms of the release instructions. And then in package down YAML say development mode auto. And when you do that, um, eh, let's get the URL from this. Um, um, the auto sets it to be, oh, I'm looking at an unreleased version in the, like there isn't a release that's associated with this. So it auto builds a special version of the package down that says that it's unreleased and it shows my um, development version installation instructions versus if I had an actual release, the package down would show the actual, like the, the full release instructions. And like, if you go to something like use this, so she has the installation instructions there. I can't remember if she switches, no, she doesn't, but you can always find that dev version um, if it's not showing the dev version, like if it has the release version, most package down sites or some package down sites have the secret slash dev version that is like the next package down site. Anyway. That was a thing that's not in the book and, you know, sorry that kind of run through that, but I, I like this because that way the, there's a like CRAN version of your package down site and a GitHub version of your package down site. And people don't get confused if the functionality doesn't match the version that they have installed. Right. Um, proofread description, you know, she says to make sure that the uh, title and the description um, say what you want. So this is um, this function or this package is specifically because I'm working with a lot of API stuff. I want um, I want to know that the arguments are what I think they are. So if it's supposed to be a single character, you know, length one character vector, and you pass in a, a you know length higher than one, I want to check those things. And there are Arling, Arlang functions for that. Um, so I guess uh, to pause for a second, um, Stas, yes, I, we're going to see for sure, hopefully. Um, actually, it's not going to get accepted yet, but I'll talk about it on Slack to make sure. I'm pretty sure once it's accepted and I switch it to released, the package down site will switch to be the non slash dev version, like the, the released version. Um, and then the dev version will be behind a flag. I don't have any that are set up properly. This is way right now, so I can't. Um, actually, let's see. Theory, and this isn't actually released, so I don't know if I. No, I don't have it set up. Okay. Um, so I can't easily check how it was created. Like I know that use this as some of some of that functionality, but um, I don't know how they built it. So we'll see. Um, other things to check in, uh, well, actually we'll get to that in a second. So this proofread description that, that mostly talking about uh, title and description. So yes, like it, there is a CICD workflow that is doing that. And mine was automatically set to the dev mode 
because I don't have a released version. And so when it ran my package down build with that um, uh, development mode auto flag, then it said, oh, okay, yeah, you're a dev mode package. Um, all right, next thing. Um, I'm not going to like go through line by line and check the or show this, but I do have a uh, return value and export or in examples for all of my exported functions. Um, this was the step that I had to get done today to, to feel good submitting is I, I wanted, well, number one, I don't think she explicitly says it, but I would do, if you're doing a new submission, like check all your exported functions and make sure you like really want to export them. <laughs> you know, if you have anything that you're like, yeah, I'm not sure about that, then don't export it yet. You can always add things to exports, but it's hard to take them away because users will be using them and then you'll break things. So like make sure the things you export, you want to export. Next step is uh, in authors. Um, Cran has been cracking down that there needs to be a copyright holder, which makes sense. They don't want to have um, confusion about who is like who owns this package. Uh, so you just need to throw a CPH somewhere. Um, often it is the same as the author, but uh, it could be the um, like the company you work for, the funder. Uh, you just need to make sure that that's somewhere. Um, you know, make sure your licensing is set up how you think it is. So you've got the MIT plus license, and you know, like that, that is uh, set up. Um, yeah, and by the way, so the um, that dev thing, I only know because we had the um, cover to cover package docs club. Um, we did, I think, just one session where we did package down because the docs are super short. And it talks about that on the package down help, but not like nowhere else that I've ever seen. So yay for our obsessive clubs. Um, and then, okay, there's this extra checks that uh, Davis Vaughn from the Tidyverse team has just a whole list of things to kind of read through and what to do about weird cases. Um, I actually ran into this one today because this is the first time with the new, I, I did the new R hub check, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And that uh, lets you turn on, like make it not install things that are only in suggests, and then it'll fail if you don't have things handled right. So um, I'll show that in more detail in a minute. Uh, but other than that, it's like, if you get notes on your checks that are any of these things, here's how to deal with them. So this site is really useful. It's linked in the book or, or described in the book. Um, and it's, you know, it's a list of things that you might run into. So if you run into something weird, go there and it'll tell you how to deal with it. All right. Um, I can't obviously show this update stuff as much, but uh, Again, use this use release issue will automatically create an, a checklist for if you're updating a package as well, something that's already on CRAN. Um, you'll want to go to uh, the check current check results. So oh, they do actually have a note on something. And so this is, happens to be a good example. Um, yeah, so... Uh, it's interesting. They have something that's showing up as a note on their CRAN logs on uh, the under development um, dev tools or um, whatever, under development uh, Fedora C line. So, um, you know, that's something you would want to check. That's something they probably will check before the next release. But there's also a good chance with that only showing up on one build and it's an unstable build, then that that might just go away. Um, but you, you know, you want to check those. Uh, there's the whole chapter about, or part of a chapter. Actually, it is the whole chapter about lifecycle. And in lifecycle, they t have a whole lifecycle for deprecating things. And so if you have anything that's in, in the process of being deprecated and you're going up to a major version, it might be time to move to the next step in that process. Uh, that's again in a separate thing. 
uh, you want to polish your news. This, this is really true if you're doing an update, because what will happen is as you're updating the package, um, like the Tidyverse team will have everyone who submits anything, they say, add a news bullet. Um, and so you'll go in there and uh, write your own no news bullet. But then they might have five steps of the news in this one release that are really the same piece of functionality that they ha had to keep tweaking or whatever. And so they'll then take all those submitted news bullets and combine them, sometimes combine them into one news bullet. Um, there's a, a URL checker that you can use to, to check for issues. This one, like if I run it, oops, um, it is going to say, yeah, uh, this CRAN link doesn't exist. I'm like, yeah, I know that. So I don't know, hopefully that's fine. Um, so that's in my, in my readme. I have a badge that tells you whether it's on CRAN. Uh, and I've always had that, and I don't remember that ever getting flagged. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, so that might end up being a flag. I don't know. Um, I've done this like a million times. Like I, I always just like Control Shift K on my README, and then realized reading the book today that that's not how they recommend doing it. That you should run DevTools Build README. Um, which I think is just knitting <laughs> the, the readme.rmd. I don't know, but, uh, oh, I, that's right. What it does is it builds your readme, making sure that you're using the dev version of your package. So if you already have your package installed, it won't use the one from your library. It'll use the one that you're working on. Um, I had never noticed that that was an option. So that is something that's probably pretty useful to make sure you do, because otherwise your readme might break if it, you know, is using a new function or something like that. So that was interesting to see. Um, if you are already on CRAN, you need to check if you have reverse dependencies. So there's this use this function to set up the rev depth check, and then you can run this rev depth check, uh, which will basically it downloads all the any packages that depend on your package and runs their tests with your new version. So you can see if you broke anything. Um, the Tidyverse team, like my understanding is their policy now is anything that shows up in there, unless you're doing something like you're using an unex unexported function or something else kind of crazy, um, they go through and fix your code if they're gonna break your code. So it's a reason to make sure your stuff's on CRAN because uh, if you make them fail a rev depth check, then they'll, they will PR your package and deal with it, which is cool. Um, and then after all that, they say to you know update that CRAN comments if there's anything worth pointing out. Um, and I, I can't remember if she talks about, but I feel like I've always had something there, even if it's um, like, uh, you know, basically saying that there's nothing, that this is just a, a resubmission or whatever. Um, yeah, so they do talk about that. They don't actually do that exact, um, check. They have a cloud thing that runs it on probably like hundreds of different machines at the same time, because yes, like, uh, dplyr or a lot of their functions, Tibble has just a, a zillion dependencies, reverse dependencies. So, um, they do that. All right. Um, and yeah, okay. And uh, later here, this, they talk all about the types of things you want to put in here. So you just tell them that I did a reverse dependency check and, you know, everything's fine. Or these are the things that we tried to contact and we couldn't get them to fix it. So, you know, basically not our problem at that point. Um, and, you know, if you have a large one, you might have uh, like exactly this comment is something you might want to point out because um, you can get a larger than usual package onto CRAN, for example, if it's something that won't be updated very often. All right. Uh, oops. Um, so yeah, CRAN checks all the packages on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Solaris, which 
is always the interesting one because no one has a Solaris machine to replicate those tests on. But thankfully, um, the uh, uh, Docker containers can help us deal with that. Um, and they use different versions of you know different software. That's actually what we're seeing here is you know all these different Linux tests or Linux distributions and whether it's the R development or the latest patch release of R or the latest release of R, the previous release of R, different ways of building things. So they do all these tests or all these systems that they test on. Uh, in the book, they talk about kind of the old way of dealing with this, which is also still what's in my checklist. They said to use DevTools check, remote is equals true, manual equals true, and DevTools check when develop. But now, there's the package R hub um, that runs. So it used to be you would send it off to their machine, uh, like to a central service, and they would deal with it. But now they have it set up with runners on GitHub Actions that you can just use R hub, R hub setup. And then well, I might as well just do the R hub check. So now that I have it set, um, oh, uh, Yeah, um, I think because I'm in the middle of a pull request, it's being it's freaking out a little, but that's fine. So I could do um, it's really weird. Actually, I'm, that is really really weird. So I'm going to just restart my R session and see if that fixes it. This whole this process is relatively new. Yeah. Huh. Um, oh, I don't have an attached remote yet because I'm in the middle of an update. Uh, I ran, so I ran this earlier. Um, I wonder if that, that will work. No, okay. Well, so, uh, I don't want to check this in, um, but, oh, I can show you the actual test. That's what I can do. So what it does is it runs um, a GitHub action with like a random name, which is kind of weird. And so this is the first time it ran. It asks you, what do you want to run it on? It has like no a numbered list. So I chose Linux, Mac OS, Mac OS ARM64, Windows, and no suggest just because she had randomly, uh, or like it's on Davis's list. Um, I think she had mentioned it in the book. And I had seen someone just mention it in passing in something else. And I was like, oh, I should probably run that where if it doesn't install your suggested packages, um, does it work? And it turned out that in no suggests, I had an error because I have a test that is, um, it requires the string I package, stringy package. And I didn't say that. And so then I went into my tests and did um, where is it? This. So go. Oh, I can I can just have it skip the test if they don't install the suggests, and then I reran my workflow, which is this, and got my green check. So um, that was helpful to learn like that that exists, and you can just. You can trigger these all the time. I didn't know you couldn't trigger them while you have a um, pull request in progress. That part's kind of annoying. Um, one, I, I probably could get it to work if I like pushed this, but didn't merge it or different things like that. But I don't want to experiment with that right now. So uh, we will see. So all right. So this this stuff, these two two steps, they mostly replace. Uh, the things that they had in the issue with the um, dev tools check and dev tools check when develop. Um, it is, it's interesting because there was a big, like, I don't know, media blitz when they implemented this, There, there's a blog post and stuff, but then when you actually look at it, like, um, let's do uh, like the documentation on this, they talk about, uh, Not it. Oh yeah, this argument is not implemented yet. Value to do like it's not entirely done yet. And I thought it was interesting that there's been all this push. Like I, I kept checking. Wait, do I have the latest version of this package? 
and uh, I seem to. So, um, so it's you know we're in in between. Um, I actually I want to try to remember to ask her. Yeah, it's all nothing to update. Um, you know, I don't know if the tidyverse team is doing this or doing the old way or doing both or what they're doing right now. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, I do link to their blog post though, which is this that you know they say to do it. And like he's on the tidyverse team. So or technically I think he's on the rlib team. Um so anyway, uh it's back here. All right. Um, through all that, like both on your local, um, you know, like you should be control shift E all through your development process that will run the R command check locally. But, uh, you know, that's only on your machine. And these R hub things runs it on all the types of machines. Um, and they have all kinds of different cases. You can have it run. I can't remember now, and I was hoping to show you the list, but it, there's a list of like 20 different, maybe more than 20, um, like forms of machines that you can run it on uh, with things like it doesn't install suggests or it runs your don't test or, or don't run uh, examples. And you can There's one that you can just say, yeah, ignore the don't run uh, directive. And so it'll see if that breaks things, um, different things like that. So. It's helpful. Um, so you need to get rid of any errors and warnings in those. And then you want to try to get rid of notes. Like the first submission always has a note, which um, actually it's going to say zero here. But if, when you run the actual R hub, it'll say, you know, new submission. Um, uh, well, that's interesting. But OK, that didn't end up with a note. So that's good. Um, so yeah, it doesn't show the note, but this is a new package. So it, like, it has a note when you do the actual submission and when you do our hub, um, there is, so there are instructions on that blog, uh, uh, if you, like, if you can run GitHub actions, I think the answer is just straight up. Yes. That it can run private packages. Um, and they have instructions for all the use cases. Uh, I don't have that use case right now, so I haven't checked, but I think so, um, that it'll let you do that. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> like their recommended way is definitely to have it just run on GitHub Actions. They have machines that you can run it on, but um, you know, that's a special case and harder to deal with. All right. Uh, you need to have, so this was uh, an old slide that I just like chopped down a little bit from the previous cohort. Um, it's good to, to have it handy. And she goes through some of these, but she also talks about the fact that the policies change. So kind of watch what the latest uh, policies are. But the baselines are, you need to have a stable email address where they can contact you with any problems. Um, you need to have the description, um, copyright info right now. That's something that they're putting that forward. Uh, you know, the way it's worded here is that you need, um, uh, like reasonable efforts to make everything work on all plat platforms and really try, like really, really try to make it work on everything. Your life is much easier if it just runs on everything. But if you have special cases, like there are packages that don't work on windows, um, or that don't that only work on Windows, um, different things like that. So I think you need to put that in your comments file. If it's and actually, I think in in the description you can say uh, specific, like it only works on this platform. Um, if you're changing anything, like if you're changing the global environment or writing a file on the file system, or deleting a file, um, installing packages. Sending info over the internet, um, I need to make sure, like, yeah, they need to, uh, the user needs to know, but I'm not sure how explicit they make you make that permission. Um, and if you're opening other programs outside of uh, R, you like the policy is you need to get permission. Um, huh. 
<laughs> yeah, I I won't go into too much detail about the, the vulnerability of R working. Yep, the way R has always worked. Um, a policy is, oops, that, there's a typo there, but you shouldn't have more than um, one submission every month or two. Uh, this isn't like a hard rule, but if you're submitting over and over, they're going to just not review your submissions. It, that's not how CRAN is supposed to work. Um, there's a line there defined of you don't want to just not fix things. So like if there's a vulnerability, um, you want to make sure that you deal with that, that sort of thing. But don't be don't plan to submit over and over. I think they um, are like more okay with it. Number one, if it's like if it's not megabytes and megabytes of change, and um, if it's a kind of young package, and you're like, oh, I need to fix this thing because we found an error. Um, you know, it, it'll be okay, but just watch that you're not going overboard with that. All right, so this is where I am. I did this. Uh, so when you do the used version or whatever, <laughs> and actually I can fix this because I know when this comes now. Um, when you do that, this is where it actually sets this version in your description file and in news, it changes to the actual version. So if we look at my git commit here, I told it not to actually commit the change that it made, but so it changed from a dev version to 010 and it changed from stable development version to stable 010. Um, and so, so I don't need to commit those. Uh, again, like the old notes. And if you like, if you read the help for these functions, they will tell you that you should run this one, DevTools release. Um, but DevTools release like does a bunch of the other checks that we've already done piece by piece. So DevTools submit CRAN is what you want if you've already done all the other checks and you don't need to run the checks that it gives you. Um, I don't want to hit that quite yet. Let's see. I do want to commit these changes. So let's uh, increment phenom. And um, let's do, I don't think there was, there was never a spell check. So I want to uh, do a quick check. Um, all of those are fine. So let's, uh, let's do it. Yep, that's me. Ready to submit? Sure. Okay. And so what that did, um, let me get my windows arranged. Um, it created this CRAN submission file. This is a temporary file that we're going to get rid of before we're done. Um, let's go ahead and just like open that. This tells, um, use this basically exactly when you submitted and the, like what the code was that you submitted. And now in theory, I should be getting a thing. Yep. I, I'm not going to load my email in the window, but I got an email from CRAN, uh, with a link in it that I click and let me, uh, Go back to this window. And say I've read the CRAN policies. Um, I've done all kinds of checks with ASCRAN and RDevel. Um, and so I will upload. All right. So it's submitted. We'll see how that goes. Um, so Hopefully I won't have to deal with these uh, steps, but this is what will come in the next, in the hours and days to come. Um, since this is new, anytime it's a new package, a human is going to look at it. So it'll, well, I guess technically it's first gonna go through some automated checks. And if it fails those, 
then it will just tell me that, but it really shouldn't fail those because I've done all the, the tests. Um, but the, at some point they, uh, they might email me and, and say, you know, fix these things. CRAN kind of famously depends on which reviewer you get can be really harsh and it's scary sometimes, but number one, like, I think it's important to know that some of that is just like some combination of language and culture that it comes across as a lot harsher than uh, the reviewer necessarily means it to be a lot of times, I think. And, you know, some of them might just be jerks and oh, well, and just don't let it get to you. So that's why I put in here. The first thing is take a deep breath. I've had things come in and they... I don't know. The way they word things sometimes is really just annoying. Like, you know, didn't you read this? It's like, yeah, I read it. And that's like, it was, it wasn't a violation of that. And here's why, but she, like, she explicitly says, uh, like step away <laughs> when the email comes in, just don't do anything. And then look at it and go, okay, you know, try to fix the problem. Um, you almost never should just reply to the email. Uh, she talks about if you go through and you just can't, there's nothing wrong, then at that point, okay, communicate via e email. Um, but if there is something that you can fix, uh, even like in some cases, it might be kind of adjacent to what they complain about, you know, fix it and put a note in your uh, CRAN comments about why that's the right thing to do. And um, something important is you do need to update the version, even though like, you know, I'm submitting 010 and if it fails 011 or 012 or 013 might be the first one that's ever pu published on CRAN because I have to update that version uh, in order to submit again, just for their own bookkeeping, whatever. The version numbers don't really matter. So don't worry about that. I have, I've definitely seen people kind of freak out about that. It's just, just do what they want. Um, Apparently you can get away with it sometimes to not update it. And so that's what people are like, oh, you should try. Like, why? Why create a potential problem for yourself? The version doesn't matter. So just update it. Um, and then you put a resubmission section at the top of your CRAN comments and you say what you have changed. Um, she has some specific examples, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, specifically say what she did there. Um, if you have, yeah, if you have specific things, like if you did rev depth checks and you need to make a note about a specific thing there, then go ahead and do that. And once you're all ready, you do dev tools, submit CRAN again, and it will package everything up and push it out. Something that, uh, I've kind of always been a little bit confused by is their recommendation is you're doing this on a branch that you're working with. Like I am on this uh, CRAN branch on my repo and I will not merge anything back in until it's accepted. And so I have changed the version number. Really all I have done is change the version number, which also changed this version number. Uh, and then it created this CRAN submission thing, but this CRAN submission thing is never actually going to go to GitHub because when I do this final step in after it's accepted, it'll delete that file. Um, yeah, and so again, only reply to the email if there's literally nothing you can fix. You, you, you can't submit another version because there's nothing wrong, but I don't think I've ever had it where I'm like, no, you're just wrong. Um, I know I have watched uh, like, kind of CRAN comments wars on packages where I'm waiting for a new version of something and you can tell that someone's just being kind of ornery and the package isn't making it through and they're trying to explain to people like, yeah, no, we need to throw an error because that's a that's a broken thing. And uh, of course we're throwing an error for that, whatever. I will say the other one is because CRAN has this bad reputation, I've also seen people where it's like, yeah, actually read their email not what you think they're saying because you do have a bug <laughs> like and fix the bug and it'll all be fine but people think that they're just being mean because uh, there's a reputation of being mean and i also i don't want to like 
I had one time I can think of where something was kind of worded mean. Almost every time it's been actually helpful comments of, oh yeah, that, that would work better that way. Um, and it's really interesting to me that, you know, just submitting some random package and a human is looking at it to say, oh, it would be, be better if you did this. Um, so there is good to it and don't be too bothered or scared by it. And think about the other side where um, they, uh, you know, they might accept it. Now she has this um, like in the checklist, there is, uh, or actually, I guess that one came out of the, I'm going to edit that because I think that came out of the um, old notes, this get push and then use this blah, 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 get push. Cause you're not really pushing You're you're, um, you're like updating it. You, you say use GitHub release and what it, that it's going to take a um, snapshot. It's going to use that file to say, okay, we want that particular check check-in to, to be um, a release on your repository. Um, and then you go ahead and update that dot 9,000 on your version number and uh, update the news to have a little section for the, the next development piece. Uh, the automatic thing that it created here says, then you tweet and I don't do that anymore. So I had to edit it. To, but the idea is then you announce it. Um, let me go back to the actual notes. Um, if you have a blog post, finish it up, you know, share it on social media, let everyone know what you do or what you did, throw it in wins and feedback on uh, data science learning community, uh, all those things. And it is interesting. There's a whole section now that if you do blog um, in package down, you can have this section in news where you um, lay out blog posts as part of the news. And it was really funny because I'm sure I've seen that, uh, but I hadn't ever noticed that until I was trying to find, um, oh, it's not here, but it was the the R Hub. Um, right, let's see, the R Hub package. Yeah, uh, I was like, oh, there was a there was a blog post about this. Where was it? And it's uh, oh right, it they do that. So in their um, on their package on site, they have the link to the blog post. Um, in the news. So that's good to do. It's good to know that you can do that. Um, and I think that is, yeah, that's it. That's all the things. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was really interested or I found it really interesting. The little, um, like the note that they have here that actually has the quote about what they, or what someone thinks about Twitter. They don't say who they're quoting. So, but um, I'm intrigued actually if that says that in the print version because um, I don't know I could imagine a publisher not wanting to say that oh, I can... <laughs> um, I'm not sure anyway so that's uh that's a submission and like we actually did one it's funny like if you're doing an update um if, like if you don't trip any alarms and like the, it's, I don't know, I don't know exactly what they use to check it, but I've had it where it pretty clearly was completely automated going from submission to CRAN because like immediately it says your package is on the way to CRAN or I guess maybe a human um, touched it, but it's it can be really, really fast. So uh, it'll be interesting thing or interesting to see. Um, okay, it has been auto processed, so we made it through the automatic checks. Um, so that's interesting to see. We'll see how it goes. And yeah, the that that update account. Um, so this particular one, the policy update, isn't too bad from what I can remember the cranberries one that is just like everything that happens on cran is pretty fire hosey but yeah this one's only like once a month when something actually changes um in the policies and not even once a month 
it's hardly ever. Uh, so, because they don't change their policies that often. They don't, I mean, part of the complaints are they don't really publish exactly what their policies are. So that part can be fun. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I am not surprised by that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't, you know, they don't talk about it, but it's interesting to watch the like the R social media landscapes shaping out. I see, I'd say at least as much R content on LinkedIn as Mastodon. I never ever would have guessed that. Um, I think like it has built-in civility because like your boss can see you on there, and so people aren't as big a jerks. But it's also like so full of AI and other um mm -hmm. like automatic content so i don't know it's it's interesting to watch you can say it on on the slack on the data science learning community if nothing else so i so number one like linkedin is highly driven by their algorithm which is really bad like there, it's not just that it's algorithm driven, but like it often has things from three months ago, just randomly show up in my feed. That's, you know, they're, they're saying I'm going to be at this event next week and it's from <laughs> three months ago. That's not helpful to see. Um, so I think it like depends what you post and what you click will make our stats show up more. Um, I, I know the Tidyverse team double posts everything or at least double on Mastodon and LinkedIn um, tidyverse slash tidy models uh, I don't know like you can also actually you know look at the hashtag of our stats there's, there's a lot of garbage in there too there just isn't as much on social media as there was two years ago for ours unfortunately um, right but what I mean by not so professional that this the stuff there it's very 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 basic <laughs> this is the so, stuff that i get get to see so uh none of the people if you are in the r packages club it's only gonna annoy you that people <laughs> people post about oh i discovered deployer select yeah um it is interesting that there's like the I don't know, official R community on LinkedIn. And that that's just not very useful to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think it has a lot to do with building your network with um, like connect with the Tidyverse team and things like that. And then that definitely influences the algorithm that you'll see more of that kind of content. And so I see a lot about like official posts from um use R about who's going to be at the conference or uh mm -hmm. you know lots of stuff from posit of course or or um i don't know different professional stuff and i don't know i i feel like i'm learning to kind of filter because there's, there's definitely the other stuff as well that is like low quality and boring that just kind of flows by and i don't even see it anymore but i know it's there like i, I if i go actually reading post by post um that is Something I learned uh, was actually explicitly taught on Twitter of don't try to read everything, like <laughs> read whatever is kind of at the top of your your feed and don't try to scroll through and read everything that comes through because it's just going to be noise. Like Mastodon doesn't have an algorithm to make the stuff that you should care about bubble to the top, but LinkedIn is very algorithm driven. And so in theory, the stuff that people are like commenting on and liking and whatever is way more likely to show up uh, near the top. So just don't go, don't dig down deep. Um, but there's, there's definitely a lot of people on LinkedIn fishing for uh, views. And so they're commenting on anything that mentions uh, machine learning or whatever. And, you know, uh, a lot of times I'm pretty sure those are automated. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer. There isn't a great social media landscape 
for data science right now. Um, but I, I do feel like LinkedIn uh, is way better than it was a year ago and way better than I ever expected it to be hmm. for our content. All right. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the book. Uh, next week we'll have Jenny um, talking to us about whatever questions we might have. Um, and yeah, we have the uh, spreadsheet link. It's linked in the, the channel. Submit questions there. Um, I might try to put a Slido together, but I don't know. There aren't a ton of us, so it might be easier to just kind of talk it out. Um, it doesn't hurt, though, so I'll probably put that together. I'll, I'll throw up a Slido, and then we can upvote questions or whatever. Um, I'll also start this week. Like My plan is um, we get first dibs, but I'll also talk about it on social media and stuff. So if people show up and want to want to attend, I'll put the link out after uh, we've all joined, <laughs> basically. Um, Jenny's not as big of a name as Headley, so I don't think it'll be as tricky to um like we've had zooms fill up when we had Hadley before and I don't think we've ever run out of room when we had Jenny uh but yeah she's really friendly and really uh knowledgeable about the whole process so come with whatever questions you might have um John, I'm wondering um, what kinds of questions have you seen been have you seen be particularly successful in the past? Mm -hmm. um, I, I sort of feel a little intimidated. It's like I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't know whether to ask some like very particular technical question or more of a general like tell us about your journey or like something in between. I don't even know where to I, begin. I think both of those kinds of questions have been pretty successful in the past. Like um, she will have a response for most um you know most technical things that you want to do she'll know she'll have a tip uh but it's also often interesting to hear like i i want to hear what she's working on right now and like um you know how did you end up at posit or something like that is always safe to um to pull in um <laughs> Yes, and we'll have to pull up the, the Jenny Bryan quote about uh, setting your laptop on fire. Okay, still have some of the, there are special hex stickers about Jenny Bryan setting, setting your laptop on fire. So, um, but yeah, no, she's like, despite that reputation, she won't actually set your laptop on fire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess maybe if you do those things to her, but uh She's been really, um, just always been really uh, helpful. We've had her twice on our packages group calls, I think. Um, and then I've spoken to her at PositConf a few times. Well, PositConf slash our studio, our studio account a couple times. She's just always great. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. I will see you all next week. Well, cool. thank you, John. Thank you, everyone.